Ja Jung is the founder of 100 Days of Rejection and author of Rejection Proof, How I Beat Fear and Became Invincible Through 100 Days of Rejection. Ja Jung came from the humble streets of China and later joined the corporate world where he took a life-altering risk and stepped into the unknown world of entrepreneurship, which resulted in everyone's biggest fear, rejection. Rejection is such a powerful force, guys. I know myself, I've struggled with it a lot, and I've had to push myself to act differently Ja Jung and I dive into his story, his struggles, and how you too can become rejection proof. Enjoy. So Ja, the first question I like to ask my guests is how do you spend your time here on planet Earth? Hmm. Um, the way I spend my time on planet Earth is I am I'm trying to build something that would help a lot of people, you know, and it will last beyond me. Uh, I want to leave a legacy, but not for my sake, but for for the fact that I want to make a positive impact, uh, you know, in the world. So that's how I spend my time. I love it. I love it, John. So, I mean, to kind of kick things off here, I would ask you how you got started. But, you know, after doing a little bit of digging, um, I guess your journey got started when Bill Gates came to your hometown in, in Beijing. What, yeah. what was that like and, and, and what did that mean to you? What, what unfolded? <clears throat> so back then, I think it was the early 90s uh, or mid 90s, dating myself now. Um, and Bill Gates is a big deal, like a huge deal. And because at the time, China just kind of started going down to a capitalistic, uh, capitalistic route when, you know, opening up its economy you know, have a lot of foreign investments and getting in touch with the Western world, basically. Uh, so uh, computers started coming into China and people started using DOS and later on Windows, right? Mm. And then it becomes a, you know, uh, at the time, I think Microsoft has a monopoly on the, on the uh, software side, on the uh, operating system side. And for, it will be for a while, right? It's basically like, you know, when you're at home, like, when we open up a computer, you see this thing, right? And then China has a lot of people. China has like more than a billion people at the time. And so not everyone had a computer back then, but there's a start, they're starting to have a lot more people having computers. And somehow one day this guy show up and he's like, I made all these. The thing you see in front of your computer, you know, when you, when you press a button, things turn on, that's, that's me. So when he showed up, I'm like, wow, that's the guy? I, so he came to China, it was a big deal. Uh, this is a celebrity, he started talking about his entrepreneurial story and I read up a ton about him. So it's almost like a, you know, like the Beatles come to the US or something. So, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was pretty exciting to see him. That's awesome. And, and so, so what did you, what, what did you say from that moment? What, what were you thinking at that time? And like, what, what did that give you an idea to do from then on out? So, you know, it used to be the heroes in China used to be like revolutionary leaders, right? The, uh, you know, the people um, like that. But when I see firsthand that a man can have this much impact in the world, uh, well, in the whole world, like in this continent that's far apart from where he is, right? He just started out in his garage and he came up with, I mean, there's lots of stories with Bill Gates, of course, but you know, but basically, but he's the moving force to actually make something happen where now they mean China are going to use computer, right? And I'm like, this is in incredible. This is incredible. This is, this story is a lot more, a lot cooler than all the stories I've heard in the past. And somehow if you can do it, you know, why can I be that? You know, like I want to have that impact too. Uh, and so, so the, the, it had a huge impact on me because before I really didn't know what I want to do. You know, you grew up, you you're just, a, you know, in China, uh, we spend a, most of our time just study, right? It's a different value system where, you know, if you're a good student, everything is, is great. People, are, people value you. But if you aren't, you're kind of uh, screwed. Uh, but then that's the first time in a long time where I, where I saw, okay, I, I see someone who, who's done this and 
I can do the same thing. I love it. And how old were you at that time when you saw Gates? Uh, I was uh, 14. Wow. You said eventually you were going to be an even bigger entrepreneur and you were eventually going to buy Microsoft, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, where, you know, you just you start dreaming, right? So I started just, I, I wrote a letter to my family and just telling them, hey, you know, I will do all these. And that includes defeating Microsoft. That includes buying Microsoft from Bill Gates after defeating him. Cool. It's, you know, it, it's, it's very, uh, you know, kind of out of world letter that I wrote. And then yeah. I finally kept this letter for me all these years. I love it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was the dream, right? And that, yeah. you know, that 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 set the seed, right? So then when you, right. you, you know, when you got older, you got a job, you got a wife, um, your your first uh, child was mm-hmm. being born, and you kind of start having second thoughts, right? You start to see like your life going on in cycles, right? Talk to me a little bit about. Yeah, I hit thirty, right? On um, and and that it's it's a huge milestone in your life, right? Because because in your 20s, you can still say I'm young, right? My whole world is in front of me. But when you're 30, you can't say that anymore. You're kind of in the middle third of your journey. Uh, and then your child is born. And that's where that's where everything got turned upside down. So for those of you who are single or, you know, who, who don't have kids, who plan to have kids, just, you know, you know, it's great to have kids, but um, when that happens, your whole world get turned upside down. You know, you're, you're, you're I mean, it's great. I, I mean, I, I love it, you know, and but it's just very different. Anyway, so when you become a father, you just get the sense that, you know, the world is different now. Uh, I am going to have more responsibilities. My priorities in life will change. Uh, so if I couldn't be an entrepreneur when I was single or when I was dating or when I was married but don't have kids, how can I be an entrepreneur as a father? There's just no way. So that's what kind of... Uh, propelled me to make some changes in my life hmm. and so so what did you do from from then on out so i feel like there's no way i, I mean i'm sure there was a way but mentally i was like playing trick with myself i'm just like hmm. i convinced myself there's no way i will become an entrepreneur if i'm a father you know just just because i know my world will be very different i i, I would not be able to responsibly quit my job uh, and I will not be able to responsibly cut out my income as a, as a dad. So I'm like, okay, I'm not a dad yet. How about if I do this before my son is born or was born? And you know, I can do this without feeling too irresponsible. So I really quit my job um, a few days before my son was born. Um, you know, and, and also, I, I, you know, I, I watched this TED Talk um it's called uh, you know you will have a mediocre career why you will have a mediocre career uh by larry smith um I think that's his name it's a uh, it's a classic and i think everyone should watch it uh because it talks about most people don't have great careers because they make up with all kinds of excuses one of the biggest excuses they have is their family so mm. you know and and so and he's like you know there are a lot of people having kids or like okay they tell their kids later on hey i sacrificed for you you know i did all these things i didn't want to do so you can do things that you want to do and he's like that's that's such bs you know why don't you just do okay i did all these things i wanted to do so i can inspire you to do all these things that, that you i mean that you want to do you know wh- why shouldn't that be um the the, the incentive there I'm like, wow, that's right. You know, there's no way. I mean, I want my son born this birth to be a catalyst for my entrepreneurship, not my uh, like that. I, mean, I don't want him. I don't want to make him to be the destroyer of my dream. And he's like, it's not fair to him. Uh, but I want to tell him someday, hey, you know, look at what we've done. You know, if we, it doesn't matter if we succeed or we don't, right? But because of you, you know, I made some positive change in my life. So. Nice man, that's uh, that's so cool. So you were watching that TED talk, yeah. And today you have a TED talk. Yeah. What I mean, dude, what's what's that like? You know, to see how 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 far you've come in your adventure. It's it's funny that it's um, life is interesting, 
uh, because when you're looking forward, you're like, okay, if I if you meet if you uh, meet this milestone, everything will be great. You know, if I become yeah. entrepreneur, my life be great. If I do this, if I write a book, that'll be awesome. Uh, if I if I give a TED talk, which was my dream, right? I watched tons of TED talks. Like if I actually have given one myself, but I have a lot of views, right? My my I would have made it, right? But you, you step by step, you actually do all these, and. And I even go back. You're like, if I have a good career, you have a, if I have a high-paying job, if I, if I've come to America, if I've graduated from, uh, you know, college or graduate school, you know, if I've done all these, you know, got, if you get married. But the thing is, when you, when you meet those milestones, you celebrate, right? But you always look forward. It's not like you know what I made it. Let me just, you know, let me let me take six months off to just celebrate and enjoy the moment. It just doesn't happen. So. You're like, you know, it's like like a team who wins a championship uh, or whatever, right? And then then the, they celebrate for a few days, and then they, they start thinking about, you know, what? Let's let's get the next one. So it's like, lot. I mean, life is like that. It's easy to to think that you made it, but but you know, I'm far. From, I'm 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 still far from achieving my goals, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm still becoming. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I wrote a post on LinkedIn this morning like mm -hmm. all about that about like like you know when you're in the mud when you're in the trenches like you have this thing and then you're like oh yeah you know once i make this amount of money or do this then all my problems will go away mm -hmm. and uh like once you realize that you end up and i'm sure you realize this too is that the story that you tell yourself about yourself still doesn't necessarily change right and um you know john when you were you know, undergoing your entrepreneurial journey, um, your your main like ghost, like your main fear was mm -hmm. rejection, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, because um, I feel like it. You know, I I don't feel I was I was you know I was brave. I don't feel I was bold in making decisions, and I uh, it, it took me you know as I, as I mentioned in my thirties to uh, to launch my company you know why was that you know i could have done this a lot earlier in fact now there's a lot of uh, people you know like you who, who are who are starting out very young right so why but why did it why did that wait for so long you know and if i had this all this desire if i have the you know all the time and it's because i was you know every time i wanted to do something i just start you know fearing stuff and also i start looking for permissions from like everyone you know i started like Somehow it's like if I go talk to my family, if I go talk to my friends, if I go talk to everyone, if they all say, great, if you don't do this, you're an idiot, go ahead, you know, I'll give you my blessing. Somehow I would might be, I might be able to be like, okay, I should do this. If one of them is saying, that's a bad idea, you know, you shouldn't have done, you should have done this because one, two, three, I'm like, oh, shoot, you know, I don't want to be rejected, you know, that's a great. Mm -hmm. So I started just like not, not doing it. So, you know, I, I, I so easy to let other people's opinion or, or, um, or, uh, advice sway what I should have done. So, you know, yeah. So that fear of rejection really stays with me for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I would say a lot of people have this problem. Do you ever, do you ever think about, you know, why you kind of have this embedded in your, in your mind and why so many of us do? Um, I actually think, that, I mean, I've done, I've read up some on, on some research and I feel that the, this fear, um, of rejection, this tendency, this desire to get along with everyone and get permission, get approval, it really comes back from our like ancient days where before when we were hunters and gatherers where we were, you know, we were pretty smart, but we weren't the strongest, but we, we weren't the fastest, right? But we're the top of the food chain. We're the hunters. We're not hunted. Why is that? Well, how can people hunt lions? Like, how is that possible? Well, that's because, you know, we were collaborators. We collaborated what be better than all other, everyone else. Uh, and, and, but the thing is, in ancient times, if you, if you are, if you're not collaborating, if you get rejected, if you, if your group don't like you, if you get ostracized, that, that means you're dead. You know you're you're not gonna be able to face 
uh, face beasts and hunt on your own and survive on your own. So you have to get along. You have to, you know, be part of a group. And to do that, you this would, would develop this fear of rejection, you know, and that is it's a safety net, right? It, it guides you toward getting along with everyone. But the thing is, nowadays, it just doesn't happen that way anymore. You know, it's not like some, a lot of people can succeed not on their own, but a lot of it would thrive and survive on innovation, right? The thing is, if, to have innovation, you're going to have to have rejection. You know, people are going to reject you because the thing you're doing and don't follow their um, what has been done in the past. So you can get a lot of rejections. So if you want to really do something amazing, you're like a rejection magnet. So you have to protect your idea. You have to protect yourself uh, and and your your own venture from other people's rejections and opinions. Yeah, I uh, I, I first started to understand this when I um, I had Seth Godin on this podcast, and he mm -hmm. told me that you know our main two fears that stem from when we were hunter gatherers were us dying and social humiliation social ostracization because then that mean you would die because you wouldn't be able to collaborate um yeah. and like from that point on i've just started to to really really understand so ja how did you start tackling this how did you start you know becoming aware of the fear and then saying like okay how do i how do i get rid of this so i started doing i mean i, I was like if i you know, because this problem has been with me for so long, and it really made made me realize that if I were to do this, I better take some radical steps. You know, uh, so so I started out do, looking for rejection. You know, like I started doing this thing called rejection therapy. I found about it online. So basically, the idea is if you look for one rejection per day on purpose, you would desensitize yourself from the pain of rejection. At the end, you will become like a like a badass. You know, I, that's, that's, that's my goal. I'm like, you know, I, I won't be, a, I won't be this badass, you know? And so that's what I did. I did this for a hundred days, you know, and every day I would go out and look for rejection. And not only that, I said, this is fun. Let me do this for, let me do a video blog, like a vlog, uh, you know? So, I, I mean, right now you see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, YouTube uh, celebrities, right? I kind of did that, you know, before a lot of them. So uh, yeah. it was, uh, and I just, Grab a phone and film my, filming myself and get rejected every day, and it was it was uh I, I, so I did this for a hundred days. Yeah, I was uh, I was watching some of those videos, man, and um I loved them. I thought they were hilarious, you know, especially because like, you know, I w I was in a position where I was once and I you know, still relatively, you know, afraid of that kind of stuff. And I kind of did the same thing of like exposing myself to that every day, just like going out on the streets, you know, asking random strangers for, for stuff. Right. I was listening to your Ted talk and, uh -huh. you know, you mentioned the, the famous Krispy Kreme story and, you know, the events that conspired after and what that ended up leading to. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So that was like, um, day three, like very early um, in my in my in my time. So you know, I mean, I started becoming kind of a pretty good at this even on day three because I on the first day you're just scared to death. You're like, this, yeah, I'm gonna get killed or it's just gonna be a big confrontation. I'm gonna regret this. But then I did day day one. I'm like, okay, I didn't die. I got rejected. I didn't die. I, I just gained so much confidence from knowing that I wouldn't die. You know, because you intellectually you know you wouldn't die, but emotionally you felt you're, you're gonna die. So on day three, I started kept I kept doing this. I was relaxed. I'm like, okay, I can come in and start making some jokes, and I can have fun, right? Uh, so I went to a Krispy Kreme shop and I said, uh, can I can you make me donuts that look like Olympic rings? You know, you basically you can can you, can you link these donuts. I just went in. I'm like, okay, there's no way they're gonna say yes. I'm just gonna come in and you know I was make a couple jokes and then I will leave, right? It's rejection therapy, right? Guess what? I just couldn't get her to say no to me, no matter what I do. And she's like, oh, okay. What does the color look like? Hmm, I think we can do this. We can't do it this way, but we can do it that way. Uh, it's going to take me a little bit. Can you, can you wait? I'm like, sure. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to say no to that, you know? And so, so 15 minutes later, she came up with a box uh, of donuts that looked like Olympic rings. Uh, it was quite amazing. It just... 
when I was leaving, yeah, it, it, it led to a huge, so first of all, the impact, the impact on me was immense. And right, I, I was just couldn't believe I got a yes from this lady who made those bar, uh, donuts. Um, so it, it just made me feel like, wow, how many these amazing moments, you know, have I missed in my life just because I thought there's no way I was gonna yes, right? I was I was preparing for no. I was actually, you know, and, and it, but if you're if you're preparing for no, the thing you do is you don't do it. You know, like, why would you go look for rejection? So that's one thing. And the second thing is, hmm, you know, when this video, when I, I published the video, in a few days, that video just went viral, you know, went to the front page of Reddit, went to the front page of Yahoo, you know, it was Yahoo back then was still like the biggest, uh, you know, like Yahoo News still has the largest traffic when it comes to news outlet, and it was the front page, and it was the Times of India, went to Daily Mail of UK, you know, MSNBC, it just went, to, it just went around everywhere. Um, and so it became a huge news. Because of that, I started getting people like sending me emails and connecting with me and telling me, hey, this is so awesome. I also have this fear. Please keep doing what you're doing. Uh, thank you for inspiring me. It really got me out of my own head a little bit. I feel like, wow, this is not just my thing now. Actually, everyone has a fear of rejection. And, you know, as an entrepreneur, your mind starts to think, it starts to change, uh, to turn, right? If everyone has this problem, right? If somehow you can develop, you're developing a solution for that. Maybe that that solution might not just be for you. It could be for everyone else as well. So you know, as an entrepreneur, you go where the where the opportunity is, and I think that's a big opportunity that I, I uh, uncovered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, that's awesome. And I, you know, I remember when I first was trying to tackle this fear, like. Mm -hmm it's it's ridiculous like it really feels like you're about to die like i would like have that feeling of like okay i'm gonna approach this person and then like all of a sudden my heart would be dun, 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 dun. my cheeks would get red and like the fear almost i could feel it as if it was like grabbing onto me and just like holding me down and it's it's really really crazy and i i know a lot of people have this i know you know some people have anxiety this and that and it's such a powerful force. And like for a lot of us, just like you said, like you were 30 years old before yeah. you kind of started tackling this. It's, um, it, it's such a powerful thing, man. I mean, what, you know, out of getting all those emails and starting to hear more people's stories, um, like what, what do you advise people? Is it just the straight up, like go expose yourself or is there a little bit more to it? Yeah. So I have the ability to do a, a mental switch now, right? I, I, mm. The thing is, no matter what you do, the, the fear of rejection is always going to be there, right? It could be like suppressed by a lot. It could be minimized by a lot, but you're never going to completely eradicate because it's your DNA, right? That's how you, that's how their ancestor, our ancestors survive. So the thing is, or if, you know, if you don't get rid of it, you have to learn to deal with it. You have to learn to thrive in spite of it, uh, in spite of it, or even maybe because of it. So, I mean, and so after I did this for a while, I started having this like a mental switch. It's almost like putting on a cape. I, I, I even like, I visualized myself putting on this invisible cape, <laughs> having this like a superpower, right? When I, but the thing is you play mental trick with yourself. Once you do that, I started thinking when I go out and talk to people and, and, Having that cape on, have made, having made a switch in my mind, I behave completely differently, right? Mm -hmm. Before, if you, if I'm like, okay, in my business or in whatever, I want something, and I really want it, and uh, I, I went over, I started just agonizing, uh, and when I ask for it, I'm like nervous, very nervous, and the other people, the people, other person can sense. Right. When I'm nervous, I my my face is different. I start to frown. I start like being very serious and trying to like convince you with my you know face and that you should say yes to me or I will be in pain and stuff like that. Right. But I, I don't get that. I don't usually don't get good results from that. You know, like trying to that's not a good way to convince. But when I put on that mental switch and cape, what I do is I started just very, being very relaxed I and mean, being very playful, you know, having fun. I'm like, hey, can I do this? And how about this? And I started like negotiating. I started just like, you know, and when you put on a charm, 
it's, it's, it's the whole dynamics completely different. I, I get a lot of yeses that way. I still get a lot of no's, but I started. But the thing is, I'm I started becoming unafraid, right? And that that that, that fearlessness actually can translate into me getting more yeses, get, having more fun from these experiences, and not be afraid that much. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I know the people that are listening to this right now that like still have this fear and haven't even tackled it. They're going to be like, you know, what the hell is this, is this guy saying? Like, there's no way this is real. Like there's no way this is works, but it, it really does. Um, my kind of version of that is, um, so I'm in, I'm in the virtual reality industry. Right. And when I'm trying to tackle this, this is going to seem really weird. But I, I will pretend that I like I just hopped into a virtual reality like metaverse. Oh. So like when I'm seeing all these people, I'm like, oh, this is just a game. And then I walk mm. up to them, I can say whatever I want. There's obviously like some like weird dissociation factor in there for sure. But for me, that really works. I don't do it all the time, but it's um it's without a doubt such an amazing and and powerful tool for sure. Yeah, it's it's um. Uh, it, it, I can completely see how that works, right? I mean, I, 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 you know, I don't have virtual reality, but I put myself into my past experience where I would do this rejection therapy, and that becomes like a, like a framework, you know, for me. If I get in that framework, I'm like, cool, you know, I'm, I'm in, right? It's like I'm, 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 uh, um, you know, uh, I, I'm in the matrix or something like that, right? Um, so. But um, you, you're like, you know, using virtual reality. You know, those mental games really work. You know, if, if, if it works for you, you know, it just do it and just develop your own, you know, you know, invisible cape, you know, whether it's virtual reality or, you know, or rejection therapy, you know. So it, it really does work. And, and I've known some of the best performers, uh, like, you know, some of the best performers, but maybe they're in stand-up comedy. Maybe they're actors. Maybe they're like speakers. And I, I know a lot of speakers, right? So uh, they do these type of tricks before they get on stage and and put, put themselves in a in a more like you know um, in a like invincible mi mindset or invincible state of mind. And a lot of times, that's all it takes. Yeah, you know, Jai, I heard this one quote once, and this kind of stems on what we're talking about. And it's the bat the best actors in the world that perform like these amazing movies, mm -hmm. they don't act, they become the character. So it literally like becomes them and they become this kind of role and embody this form that allows them to, you know, go past a little bit of their identity and their fears and insecurities. And it leads on to, you know, doing something that you never think you'd be able to do before. Right. I'm sure like when you were doing your TED talk, like were, were you nervous when you were doing your TED talk or, or anything like that? Um, it, it's interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually uh, I am uh, and I try to be, you know, and actually because I, I want to get a little bit like nervous energy. And the last thing I'm on is coming and completely relaxed. And I'm like, hey, just I start to become very chatty. And usually they're not good talks, you know, when you, when you become very relaxed and you want to come in, you want to stay with your script. You want to make sure you get, you can say the most things with the least amount of words. And that's actually take an art form to do that. Um, so yeah, and and it's, uh, I still, I still get a little bit nervous. And in fact, I try to get nervous uh, and before this, right? And also, you know, the dimensioning, you're like, you know, these actors that become those characters, like there are stories like Daniel Day Lewis, right? Uh, he was like acting in this movie, uh, Lincoln, and he just became Lincoln for three months. He became really weird about people around, you know, just just uh, amount of people around him. But he started talking like, you know, he's he started denying his own personality. He just become Lincoln. I'm Lincoln now. I'm Lincoln in 21st century. So yeah, and he just did that, and then he became. So he started feel what Lincoln would feel. He would start saying things. So he, he did a really good job. Like, of course, you know, that's that's a really great movie. Um, um, so that's how he got into character. So, you know, a lot of times we 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 all need to get into character. That doesn't mean the real me is not true, but it's also like an enhanced version of me. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was really well said. Um, I mean, what I gotta ask you this. While we're on the subject, um what 
what advice would you give to somebody that's uh, public speaking for like the first time at like an event? Um, just for reference, tomorrow I have my very first speaking engagement. So anything helps. <laughs> wow. Okay. Congratulations. Thanks. So, well, what kind of event is that? It's uh, it's LinkedIn Boston. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. How many? Like, do do you know the size of the audience? Um, I th not. Too, I think it's like a hundred people. I don't think it's anything big or anything like that. Okay, that's pretty cool. That's actually a really good size for you to rehearse your your skills. So when I started doing this, right, um, you know, I I, I started getting these speaking invites, and uh, one of my first ones was like a TEDx, uh, like you know, TEDx Austin. They have a thousand people, like basically the lot of uh, you know very well educated people in Austin start, you know, we're, we're going to be there. It, you know, it, it was going to be a big deal for me. So when I get this opportunity, I'm like, wow, I hope I, put, I hope I don't blow it. Right. So, um, so I asked my professor is actually quite, quite well known in the, in the uh, behavioral economics and uh, in the industry. And, and he's uh, also, he's like a four time TED speaker. Like he, his name is Dan Ariely. He, he like, he broke the record. So I, I said, hey, Dan, how do I how do I do this? And he's like, well, congratulations. But when you have this this type of opportunities, what you want to do is you don't make the don't make them the first time you speak on something. Right. Go in smaller crowd, speak in front of smaller crowd first and gain some confidence and know which line uh, will, will draw laughter, will draw, will get people's attention. Uh, so uh, rehearse and use that. And. And you don't have to do that in front of a mirror or just in front of your, your, uh, you know, your girlfriend or wife or, or boyfriend. Just you know, use real people. So I started going to these, these meetups, just kind of use these meetups. Keep, I give talks and, and I, I use those uh, those times to those opportunities to uh, to really to develop my talk, kind of like stand up comedian. And, and they do, and, I mean, like they do the same thing. They 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 test their jokes in the comedy clubs, right? So I would start going to these meetups and trying to uh, use these uh, events where I'm in front of a crowd. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be huge. Sometimes it's like 10 people, sometimes it's like 50, right? But I, I put myself in front of them and start speaking. I can observe, I can learn what works and what doesn't. So when I got on a big stage, over a thousand people, right? Um, you know, when I did that, I remember the people who were my, I was sharing the stage with people who are like scientists, who are like social movement people, right? The people who went to Africa, who changed their data collection problem, uh, you know, and they're like solving some huge, huge amount of world issues, right? And I was a rejection guy. And I'm like, all I did was asking for rejection. Like, I'm, I'm like, man, how do I, how do I actually perform well? Like, how do I? You know, these are very intimidating figures. Then I thought. Hmm, I'm a freaking rejection guy. None of these people actually have this experience where they're getting rejected, you know, and and actually have an advantage, not you know, not a disadvantage. And also because I've rehearsed in front of a real audience, like 10 people, 50 people. I've done that. So I know this works. Having that confidence that this works, this will work, has this have worked on other people, give me such a big advantage. So um, you know, uh, the thing about doing speaking is a lot of that is confidence as well. When you're on stage, when you, when you sense like you're going cold, when you're sense like the, the you know audience is not responding, your your behavior change. You started trying to mm -hmm. somehow convince them, trying to act out them more, trying to convince them to give you more positive response, right? But I didn't have to do that because I know that this material works, and I've tried this in front of you know other people, so I don't I don't have to like act out of character. I can just stick with my what I'm doing, and that's a that's that's a big difference. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, those are those are all awesome tips, man. Thank you very much. So, Jai, to um, so I guess you know, kind of start closing things off here, man. I know this is gonna seem like a very uh, wishy washy question. Might be a little bit hard for you to to answer, but I mean, you know after starting your journey, after learning all these things, after, you know, repeatedly ta tackling your, your, your rejection fear, after speaking on your rejection fear, talking to a bunch of people on this, in, in what aspect has, you know, 
developing the skill of getting over your rejection helped you out? Has it helped you out in business and in entrepreneurship? Well, first of all, rejection became my business. You know, it became, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned as entrepreneurs, you go, it's not like you think of a cool idea, you try to realize the idea, right? It's being entrepreneur is you find a problem, right? And they try to find the solution for the problem. I got a problem here. And the problem is everyone, everyone in the world is afraid of rejection. You know, we're, we're the vast, vast majority of us, right? So I'm in a pretty good position. If I can find a solution for that, I'm sure a lot of people will, be, will use it. So that's my goal. Um, so, but also, I mean, I, I mentioned that I, I have this, I feel like I have this invisible cape. Like I have this thing, I got this mindset I can, I can fall back on or I can, I can have this character I can get into, right? When I, so uh, it has helped me tremendously when I deal with like family members or friends or in business settings, because I, I just know that if I, I can, if I'm not afraid of rejection, if I can just go out and just, you know, if I know how to deal with rejection, right? If I know how to ask in a way that doesn't offend people, doesn't, you know, I can, I know, I learn how to uh, make people not be threatened, not be offended when I make requests. I can ask anything from anyone anywhere. Mm. Like, you know, so that type of, is that almost like a superpower. So it has helped me tremendously in my, in my, uh, in my talk. And I, I, I remember, um, you know, I, I, I'll give an example, a quick example. This is where I did like, I was 50 days into my 100 days of rejection. Went to this like amusement park. Uh, it's like a more like a local, like a pumpkin park, right? Doing a uh, fall festival. So you know, so even though this big place and there's like a long, huge lines of cars, it took like an hour to get into this park. Once you get in there, uh, guess what? They take everything by cash. You know, they didn't tell us. Like, I'm like, who use cash nowadays, right? I have, yeah, this is a credit card. Why don't you do Apple Pay? Come on. So everyone, they're taking everything by cash because they were like farmers. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't have any cash, right? And I got my wife and kids here. And I mean, if I get, if I go out and drive like 20 minutes and try to get an ATM, I will not be able to come back in in time because again, the line line for cars is like one hour. So, so my wife is like, ah, it's okay. You know, we'll just walk around. I'm like, no way. I'm not going to let you walk around in the park. So I started panhandling uh, in the park. And <laughs> I just I put on this cape and I'm just like, you know, put on charm and saying, hey, can I borrow, can I, can I borrow $5? Can I borrow $20? You know, can I, do you have any money? Uh, because I, you know, I, I don't need the money, but I do need the money now because I, I don't have cash. Uh, I don't want this, you know, I don't want, I want my kids to have fun. People are just giving me, people start giving me money left and right. And pretty, pretty soon I got like, you know, 50 bucks and I were, you know, and they were having fun. They were taking rides. And I, you know, and then, and my, my wife and, and mother-in-law, they were just, their, their jobs just, just dropped. And they're like, you know, what's, first of all, handling is, is, you know, you just don't even think about it, right? As a normal person. Is don't think about asking money from strangers. And you did like I asked for like thirty people. I'm like, how do you do? How can you do that? Like, there's no way they would be able to, you know, and just set aside their pride to do it. I'm like, hey, I have, at that moment, you know, it's just, I, I can do it. I can, I can ask anything. I can I, I, I can ask people's kidney if <laughs> if I have if I have a if I have a, a, a right if I have a right reason. I give them the right reason. You know, having that those reasons it will liberate me. Right. I'm like, I'm telling them, hey, I'm not, I'm not, I don't need money, but hey, I need some help. You know, if you help me, that's great. If you don't, I understand. How about if I pay you back? You know, how about if I PayPal you back? How about, you know, I start giving them all these things. People are like, oh, this is another guy. This is just, he's not trying to just lie. He's actually, you know, need this money for now. And I, so most people just didn't ask me, like, ask any money. I mean, they didn't, they didn't even ask on, in, like, my money back. They're just like, take, take this money. So, it was, it was, it was one example I, I often think about, like, there's no way I've done this like before, but now I can. Yeah. Wow. And you know, in life, most people never ask, you no. know, right. that's awesome, man. So job, we will, um, everyone can go check out your website, all your social media links in the description below, but uh, do you have like a particular preferred network that you like to talk to people on? 
And um, do you have like anything specific that you want people to check out right now or anything like that? Yeah. yeah. So, um, okay. My venture right now is I'm, I'm a technologist, right? I've been working in tech nice. for a long time and I want to use my skills in tech to, um, you know, to find a solution for, for the rejection problem. I want everyone to have this, this invisible cake. So what I did is I, I built, I prototyped an app um, as it's, it's a web app. So basically you can access that using your phone with your browser. You don't have to go to the, the Apple app store or Android app store, but just go to my website, uh, rejectiontherapy.com. I bought, I, you know, I bought the website. I actually bought the whole thing from the original owner uh, because I, you know, and I, uh, I mean, he believed I can take this farther than, than, than he did. So he sold it to me. And so I have that site now. So go to rejectiontherapy.com. Uh, you can find a link to actually test out my app. I would love for you to give me feedback. I would love for for uh, for you know, for, for you know, I mean for the audience to experience this themselves uh, and and see how far this can take them. Now you know what kind of impact it has on them. Wow, that's awesome. I'm gonna check that out, man. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. So Josh, so final thing. I like to request that my audience uh, or excuse me, my guest leaves the audience with a self inquisitive question. Um, you know, a question they can kind of ask themselves. I find that questions, especially introspective ones, are are really beneficial. And I'd love it if you could ask my audience a question. Yeah. So um, think about if you have no fear of rejection or if there's two things. If there's no rejection, what would you do? Or if there's no fear of rejection, you know, if there's rejection out there, but you take away the fear, what would you do? And think about those things first and then, you know, do them, you know, and do them. Uh, don't, you don't have to do it, you know, right away, but lead it, then lead up to them. Try small things and, they, you know, they get there. Because the fear of rejection is like the foolish, foolish, foolish game to play. You know, you, you're just rejecting yourselves. You, when you're not getting out there, you're rejecting other people. You're just rejecting yourselves. So, you know, don't reject yourself. Yeah, I, I love that so much, man. Ja Jung, thank you so much for coming on the Humans 2.0 podcast, man. Absolute pleasure. I don't want to leave it on any stronger note than that. Thank you to everyone out there for listening. This has been your host, Mark Metry. Damn, you made it till the end of the podcast. That's really rare in the age of digital distraction. This really means the world to me. I really hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to hop on over to my website, Mark Metry, or message me on social media. I'm on Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter. My name is Mark Metry, M-A-R-K-M-E-T-R-Y. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what you learned in this episode, and I'll be sure to get in touch with you. And if you really, really love the podcast, I'd highly appreciate it if you went on iTunes right now and left me a review. It helps way more than you know. Let's get this Humans 2.0 grassroots movement going. Woo! Get out there and do something impactful today.